So today I encountered a really interesting function while I was looking on the math stack exchange and I thought I'd make a video about it. And the function in question is, well, this monster. So I'll call it f of x and it's sine of pi over two times sine of pi over two times sine of, and then you can see we go on and on and on. And in the infinite depths, we have a single sine function. And well, maybe first in order to uncover what we really mean by this function, we need to be a little bit more careful with its definition. And so anytime you see like this kind of infinite nesting, a good way of defining it is via a recursion of a sequence of functions. Okay, so let's maybe introduce the following notation. We'll say f sub zero of x is equal to sine of x. And then f sub n plus one of x is equal to sine of pi over two times f sub n of x. And notice this is gonna hold for all n bigger than or equal to zero. And I think that does the trick. And now it like puts the question in terms of a limit of a sequence of functions. And that would be maybe expressed as what is the limit as n goes to infinity of f sub n of x. And that would be our function f of x. Of course, if this converges, and if you've ever seen sequences of functions, you probably know that where they converge, well, it depends on what number you plug in. But we'll show that we get a point-wise convergence here, which means for a chosen point, it will converge to a certain number. So, okay, that's good. So let's maybe start evaluating this sequence of functions at some nice places and then after which we'll come up with a guess of what's going on. But maybe I'll call this limit equal to f of x, which is this function in question up here. And I know we haven't proven that this converges yet, but it'll at least give me a name for, well, what we're evaluating. Okay, so let's maybe start with the following observation. And this is built off well, what's the easiest thing to plug into this function or the easiest things? And I think probably the easiest thing is if we plug in x equals zero. That's because f sub zero of zero will be sine of zero, but sine of zero is simply zero. But then f sub one of zero is equal to, well, it'll be sine of pi over two times f zero of zero, but that's simply zero. So it's sine of zero, which is zero. And then I can think you'd probably see that we're gonna get zero here on out. So in other words, we have f sub n of zero is equal to zero for all n bigger than or equal to zero. Okay, great. So what this tells us is that definitely at the point x equals zero, we have convergence. And that's because for x equals zero, this is a constant sequence. And so I think we can reliably say that f evaluated at zero is definitely equal to zero. So let's put a nice box around that. And then as we go on and find these values of the function and build up you know, what it might look like, we'll have a graph that comes on the screen. So there we've put a point at the origin. But this is not super special. Maybe we also have something interesting happening at integer values of pi. And that's because f sub zero at integer values of pi will be zero and then all of this will just repeat. Okay, so let's look at that. What if x equals n times pi, where like I said, n is an integer. So that means like x is equal to pi or two pi or three pi or four pi or negative pi, so on and so forth. Well, if we do f sub zero of n times pi, well, we'll get sine of n times pi, but that's exactly equal to zero. And then likewise, f sub one of n times pi will also be equal to zero. That's because now we get sine of zero and then we can continue this on and on and on and we'll see that f sub n of n pi, or maybe I should say f sub m, I need a different index here. 
uh, will also be equal to zero for all m bigger than or equal to zero. Okay, so now we can put this together just like we did before. And notice that we have a constant sequence, which means our function has a value of zero at every integer value of pi or integer multiple of pi. So now we can start putting those on our graph. Okay, and then maybe where would we go from there? Well, I think probably the best place to go from there is a place where sine is equal to one. So let's look at what happens if x is equal to pi over two. Well, in that case, we have f sub zero of pi over two is equal to sine of pi over two, but sine of pi over two is one. And then f sub one of pi over two will be sine of pi over two times f sub zero of pi over two, you know, using our recursion. But that'll be sine of pi over two times one, which is sine of pi over two, which is one. And then you can see that we're building a constant function again. And so here we have f sub n of pi over two is simply equal to one. And this is gonna be again for all n bigger than or equal to zero. Okay, but since we've got a constant function, we know we definitely have convergence. So we have f of pi over two is equal to one. So the limit function evaluated at pi over two is equal to one. Okay, so we can put that on our graph. And then we can immediately recall that sine is two pi periodic. So that means at, for instance, five pi over two and also negative three pi over two, we get a value of one for our final function f, you know, via a very similar argument. And then also we'll get a value of negative one for inputs of like negative pi over two and three pi over two and everything that's two pi times an integer away from negative pi over two. So now we have a lot of points plotted and we have to figure out what's going on in the middle. And that's what we'll do now. And in order to motivate how we're going to fill in all of the rest, we'll make a pretty careful argument about what happens if x is between zero and pi over two. And then that extends to everything else via very, very similar methods. Okay, so if x is between zero and pi over two, what do we know? Well, we know that f sub zero of x is equal to sine of x. But if x is between zero and pi over two, that means that sine of x is between zero and x. So here we have zero, f sub zero of x and x. Of course, that's because sine of x is simply f sub zero of x. And so you can see that by looking quickly at the graph of the sine function versus the function y equals x. Okay, so to start our argument, we're gonna compare f sub zero and f sub one. So I'll write those out explicitly. So f sub zero, well, that's just the sine function, so sine of x. And then f sub one of x, well, look at this definition over here. It'll be sine of pi over two times f sub zero. So this will be sine of pi over two times sine of x. And now our goal will be to determine which one of these is larger when x is on this interval. And in order to do that, we're going to define a function which is their difference. So this function g of x will be f sub one of x minus f sub zero of x. But you know, we could write that out as sine of x minus sine of pi over two times sine of x. But now there's this nice formula involving trig functions or involving the sine function that allows you to simplify differences like this. So in fact, it'll take something like sine of alpha minus sine of beta and rewrite it as a product of sine and cosine. And that formula should be on the screen right now if you don't remember it, but we will apply that formula to this right here, where x is playing the role of alpha and then this pi over two times sine of x is playing the role of beta. So that, like I said, will allow us to simplify this a little bit. This will now be two times sine evaluated at pi over two times sine of x minus x over two times cosine of, 
Well, essentially the same thing with a plus. So pi halves sine of x plus x over two. And then I'll just bring my g of x down. Okay, good. And now let's put a little box around that. And what we'd like to determine is, is this positive or negative when x is between zero and pi over two? And in order to do that, I'm gonna extract these two terms right here and talk about their size on this interval. And I'm not gonna go through all of the details to work out you know, their precise inequalities, but we'll just kind of jump to the result. I think this would be maybe a nice little homework exercise. And I'll put this little box here, and that box could be either this first term or that second term. You would have to do them kind of like individually. And what you can check is that this box is between zero and pi over two. But if you plug something between zero and pi over two into sine, you get a positive number. And if you plug something between zero and pi over two into cosine, you also get a positive number. So that means here, g of x is positive. Okay, so let's write that down. So g of x is bigger than zero for all x on the interval from zero to pi over two. Oh, but what does that tell us? Well, notice g of x was f1 minus f0. Well, if that's positive, that means f sub one is larger. So here we have f sub zero of x is less than f sub one of x. And notice that down here we have zero, so that is smaller than f sub zero. That's because f sub zero is sine, and like we said before, sine is positive on this interval. Now, where will we go from here? Well, notice in order to get to f sub two, all you have to do is apply the sine function. But the sine function is increasing on this interval. And since the sine function is increasing on this interval, if we apply it to this, we'll end up with something larger. And if we apply it to, well, this inequality right here, it'll just shift the inequality up. So that means we'll get this is all smaller than f sub two of x, which is in turn all smaller than f sub three of x, and then so on and so forth. And then that's all bound above by the number one. And that's because, well, we're all inside of a sine function, which is always bound above by one. Okay, so that's what we have so far. But that means that this sequence f sub n of x, well, when x goes between zero and pi over two, is bounded, well, bounded above is what matters here, and increasing. So it's an increasing and bounded sequence. But then by the monotone sequence theorem, that tells us that it converges. And now let's work towards finding its limit. So we just showed if given x between zero and pi over two, that our sequence, which was f sub n evaluated at x, is an increasing and bounded sequence, which means it converges. But now we can use the standard trick whenever you have recursively defined sequences to find their limit in this scenario. So let's say that L is the limit as n goes to infinity of f sub n of x. But now I'll notice that the limit of f sub n of x is the same as the limit of f sub n plus one of x. That's because that index is going to infinity no matter what. But now this f sub n plus one of x can be rewritten using our recursion over here as the sine of pi halves times f sub n of x but the sine function is continuous, so that means we can bring that limit inside. So in other words, we have sine of pi halves of the limit as n goes to infinity of f sub n of x. Oh, but this is exactly our limit L that we introduced right here. So we have this is equal to sine of pi over two times L. So another real quick thing that we need here 
is that since all of the values of f sub n were between zero and one, that means that the limit is also between zero and one. But actually, when you take the limit, you're, you include the non-strict inequality that was there. You also have to include the equals part of the inequality. So that means L is between zero and one. It's allowed to include zero and one. Okay, so let's maybe cut out the middle of this equation and see what we get. We have L is equal to the sine of pi over two times L. So now we just have to find the value for L, but there's only one possible value for L here, and that's L is equal to one. That's because sine of pi over two times one is equal to one. I guess you could carefully do this by looking at the intersection of two functions. The function which would be like y equals x and the function which would be like y equals pi over two times x and then argue that there's only one intersection there. But I think that that's maybe a little bit more work than we wanna to get to because this is like evidently true. Okay, so that means we have this limit as one. Okay, so what does that mean we've shown? Well, for all x between zero and pi over two, the value of our function is equal to one. So let's write that down here. So for all x between zero and pi over two, I guess now I can put including pi over two because earlier we showed that f of pi over two was one. So we have f of x is equal to one. So now we can put that into our graph as well. And then using very, very similar strategies, we can fill in the rest of the graph. So you'll end up seeing that this function is equal to one when x is anywhere between zero and pi. And it's equal to negative one when x is anything between negative pi and zero. And then you can apply the two pi periodicity to fill in the rest. But then if you include the graph of the sine function on the same set of axes, you'll see that essentially what this function is doing is answering a question. And that question is, is the sine function positive, zero, or negative? And what you'll end up seeing is that we get a value of one if sine is positive, we'll get a value of zero if sine is zero, and we'll get a value of negative one if sine is negative. But there's actually a defined function that gives us something like this, and well, it's called the sine function, just spelled differently instead of S-I-N-E, it's S-I-G-N. So it pulls out the sign of a number. And so in fact, a nice closed form way of writing this function is the sign of the sign of X, where you have the two different signs there. And I think that's like one of the things that's coolest about this problem is, well, we started with this crazy iteration, this infinite iteration, well, and we ended up with a composition of two different types of signs. And that's a good place to stop.